Hello, this is Margaret Knoll with the League of Women Voters of Portland, and you are watching the Video Voters Guide. Along with the Metro East Community Media, we are here today with candidates who are running in the May 2020 primary election. With me is Tom Harrison, running for U.S. House of Representatives, Oregon's third district. Welcome, Tom. Thank you. Could you please tell us a little about yourself and why you are running? Sure, that's pretty easy, actually. It uh, started a couple of years ago. I had no particular ambition for political office, but I've been politically active for a long time. And I've uh, a definite set of beliefs, which I would call principal conservative beliefs. I uh, was annoyed to find there was no running against uh, Earl Blumenauer in the last, in the 2018 cycle. So I mounted a write-in campaign uh, beginning on the 3rd of May, and I won the nomination for the Republican Party because nobody had run. I just, nobody chose to stand up. Earl has such a long history, you know, and the district has favored him for a lot of years. But I don't like what he does. I don't like his stances, and I don't like the fact that he has left so much poverty in Portland and not done enough to address it. So I ran. I fared reasonably well in the general election, but it's not enough, so I'm running again. Uh, my bit background is uh, a life in the sciences. I have been running a business for the last 40 years, and uh, Earl, on the other hand, has spent his virtually his entire life in politics. I am of the belief that life in politics should be short, not long, and it should be accompanied with an extensive amount of time spent de dealing with things that everybody else has to deal with every day. So that's why I'm running. Um, how do you think Congress can best address the current pandemic and its economic consequences? Well, first thing is, keep it clean. Right now, there is so much muddying of the waters in Congress with trying to add uh, all of the favorite projects into bills that are designed to simply uh, sustain workers. I have a problem in general with the intervention in the economy, uh, and that is because of the idea of a constitutional taking. When government says you've got to stop working, that's a taking from people. And constitutionally, the idea of eminent domain, where you take property for, for government use, you have to compensate for that. So there's this idea of compensation. But one emergency is breeding another. So the least we can do is try to keep it as clean as possible. No pet projects, just deal with the issue at hand. As it is, that's a danger to the Constitution, but clearly it's an emergency, and clearly we're not going to walk through it with our hands off. So Congress needs to do it better than it's doing it by keeping all the rest of the politics out of it. Let's see, the current pandemic has exposed problems with America's healthcare system. Hospitals are struggling and losing money, and some patients are facing bills that they can't afford to pay. Do you think the healthcare system needs to be changed, and what changes, if any, would you suggest? Well, now's not the right time to make such a decision anyway, in the middle of, an, of, a, of a crisis event. But quite frankly, I think the, the American healthcare system has shown itself to be outstanding in this episode. It's uh, doctors and nurses and uh, uh, frontline workers are all hands on deck. That's not a problem with American health care. That's a positive thing. The, the issue of insurance and people not being able to pay bills, of course, government has already stepped in and said for, it's for a lot of the things associated with the, uh, the pandemic, uh, health care is just to be free, get, get it done. Well, of course, it's not free. We're all paying for it. Uh, but the, the issue for the American health care is, look how we're responding compared to the rest of the world. The death rate is extraordinarily low, actually, considering. And the death rate in New York City was amplified by the early movements of the administration to tell New Yorkers to simply keep on doing what they were doing, to not respond at all. That was a problem. It should be a fairly normal thing for people to, to think of an infectious disease and say, I should stay away from people. That should be a fairly normal response. But the response that's been taken in New York City exacerbated the problem. Now, we seem to be getting over the hump there. Their death rate's going down. That's good. 
but the uh, the healthcare system itself, this is not the right time to discuss the changes. But as it is, better to have people have more liberty to choose the health care plan that they want and the coverage they want, rather than operate on compulsion, which always generates a pushback from the system because the system cannot afford to pay everyone perfect health care. It will never happen. So, but now's not the time to talk about it. The time to talk about it is in the, if you pardon the expression, the post-mortem of this emergency. How should Congress um, most effectively perform its oversight responsibilities of the executive branch of the national government? Hmm. Well, that'd be nice if we could keep politics out of it and keep it as a action involving uh, uh, direct criminal accusations, perhaps, or in the circumstance of uh, allocating of funds, it should be done according to the the uh, the, the, uh, uh, the committees that are involved in that. Uh, so, oversight is to be done to observe that that the president and the administration is uh, doing its best to navigate the laws that are established because that's their job is to enforce the law. So, executive branch oversight should be that Congress now, with having passed laws and, and laws being on the books, uh, sees to it that those laws are followed. That's the significant part. Uh, and uh, what I've seen over this last year, the last couple of years, is an absolute disaster in that regard. It's uh, uh, not, not about that. It's about finding any political means possible to eliminate the president. I don't find that helpful at all. Um, do you favor or oppose the abolition of the Electoral College, and why? Oh, that's pretty easy. The Electoral College is designed to, uh, to uh, manage the idea that we're not a full democracy. Uh, there is a certain amount of tyranny in a democracy. It's a mob tyranny, but it is nevertheless a form of tyranny. Uh, the old expression cliche is, uh, democracy is like uh, three wolves and two sheep voting on dinner. That's uh, the obvious result is, uh, is obvious to anyone. If you look at our country, we have a lot of different people with different ideas of how they should be able to live. We're not all the same. We shouldn't all have to be the same, nor should we be governed in a manner that doesn't allow for the separation between areas. Rural states are going to vote differently than, than the urban states. That's normal, and it should be something which is managed by the system. The Electoral College does that fairly effectively. It doesn't allow the, uh, the, er, the rural states that are lightly populated to be completely ignored in the electoral process. And this is only electing the president, mind you. It doesn't affect the electing of representatives. States do that by themselves already and do it just fine. So we're only talking about the presidency here. But the presidency has to manage both the uh, idea of representing the people, as well as managing this United States that we have. So they have to touch both, which is why the Electoral College has, is heavily centered on population and also provides a distinction so that the states aren't forgotten in the middle of all that. So I'm very much for it. Okay, well, thank you. Um, this has been the Video Voter's Guide. Thank you for watching. The primary election is on Tuesday, May 19th. Please be sure to inform yourself about the candidates and ballot measures and exercise your right to vote.